it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, um, Harold Kloster, who is a longtime member of Temple Bethel. We're so fortunate. Oh, oh my goodness, Temple Bethel. Temple Bethel was the temple that Peter and I belonged to in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> wow, that's a throwback. Where did that come from? Yeah, right. <laughs> right, go back to Flint because they have such good water. Um, anyway, Harold's going to be talking about horse from bones to bestseller. Um, Harold is a director emer emeritus of Smithsonian Affiliations, a program created during the Smithsonian to Americans in their own communities. During his 13 years as program's director, he developed over 200 partnerships with museums and educational organizations uh, across the country. So a wealth of experience, a wealth of knowledge, and a, and a great, I'm sure, great stories. So please Har uh, welcome Harold. Good. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here at Temple Micah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Temple, my guy to write, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I do, ha I have to, in the way of starting, I just have to admit that it's, it's a very, very strange experience to have a casual conversation, perhaps like a conversation you've been having over lunch, to have that conversation turned into a bestseller. Uh, I, there's nothing at all that I can compare it with. Or um, Geraldine Brooks, a very well-known author. Um, I met her once. We had a casual conversation. I shared a little bit of history, a story that uh, long forgotten that only Smithsonian people know about, museum folks. And uh, and before too long, she took that story, ran with it, and turned it into a bestseller. Um, the book came out in 2002. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for over a year, uh, won numerous awards, and now it has just come back out uh, as a paperback book. And I think uh, it's number four on the Washington Post uh, paperback book list. She very kindly uh, acknowledges me in the book and in some of her public speaking as the inspiration for this uh, for this book, for this story. And I brief I make a very brief appearance in the book on page 10 uh, uh, under the fictional name Horace. OK, Harold Horace. OK, not bad. Um, and. Uh, and so that's that's where this talk begins. But before I get into it, and since I'm talking about acknowledgments, uh, I want to also acknowledge um, my in-laws, Jerry and Vivian Liebenau, who were founding members of Temple Micah. Some of you may know them or recall them, both past presidents of Temple Micah, and, and they introduced me to the Temple Micah community. 50 years ago, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to um, all of the Smithsonian staff, employees, and volunteers who are or have been members of Temple Micah. You may or may not realize, but there have been a lot of people here who have worked at the Smithsonian uh, there was a time where I thought Temple Micah could have actually taken over the Smithsonian if it wanted to. Uh, but so I just, uh, for all those who may be in that group or may be listening, uh, my thanks and appreciation for your friendship and support over the years. Uh, now, so uh, to the book, Horse, what, what is this book really about? Well, it's about a horse. His name was Lexington, and uh, he was considered one of the greatest racehorses, if not the greatest racehorse in American history. Um, but the book is much more, if you're not into horses, and I can understand that, 
if you're not into horses, if you're not, it's much more, the book itself is much more than a, just a story about a horse. And just to read you one, one little description of it um, from a, a blurb, it says, quote, a discarded painting in a junk pile, a skeleton in an attic, and the greatest racehorse in American history. From these strands, a Pulitzer Prize winner braids a sweeping story of spirit, obsession, and injustice across America. So that's, it's, a, it's quite a sweeping tale. Now, Lexington himself, uh, you can see the, the dates that he, uh, he, was, he lived, he was here. He was, uh, during the 19th century, there was no doubt that he was the greatest racehorse in America. Uh, he won practically every race that he started. Um, and in those days, a, a, a race was four miles long. Now, think of it now, the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, Belmont, all the major horse races are a mile and a quarter. So four miles, you think of the speed and endurance that they would require for a horse to do that. Um, any contemporary thoroughbred would never be able to make it um, on, on a course that long. So that's one thing, but he's also known as the greatest sire in American horse racing history. And he still holds that record. If you were to look him up in Wikipedia, uh, you would read the following. Retired because of his faltering sight, Lexington became a stud and sired 575 foals. For 16 years, he was the country's leading sire, including two years posthumously. Now, I, I have no idea how you do that. <laughs> so, so during the Q&A, don't ask me. I don't, I don't know how that's done. <laughs> uh, to this day, no sire has ever produced as many champions. From 1855 to 1880, more than 230 of his progeny won nearly 1,200 races. Four triumphed at the Belmont Stakes and three offspring won the Preakness Stakes. Preakness himself was one of Lexington's foals. The trophy given to the winner of that storied race features a portrait of Lexington standing atop the vase. So that will give you uh, some idea of who we're talking about. Now, uh, Lexington, uh, passed away in 1875, and for the uh, the next 135 years um, was at the Smithsonian, his bones, um, sometimes on display and sometimes in the attic, as many people have commented, including Geraldine Brooks. Now, here's the first spoiler alert. There is no attic at the Smithsonian. Everyone thinks there's an attic. The press always calls us the nation's attic, but people who work at the Smithsonian cringe every time they hear that term. There is no attic. Each of the museums has their own secure and climate controlled storage space. And there is also a very large storage uh, facility in Suitland, Maryland, called the Museum Support Center. Uh, and this is just one little corner of that facility. This is where everything that can't be stored in the museums is stored out in Suitland, Maryland, just about 10 miles from here at the Smithsonian Museum Support Center. I'll give you another look. This is, this is how things are stored. Uh, you can see on the picture of the right is, uh, is where they do airplane restoration work, uh, also out there in Suitland, Maryland. So um, you need a whalebone? Anyone need a whalebone? We have a lot of those too. Um, it's estimated that there are over 150 million artifacts at the Smithsonian. Um, and that's a number that would make any normal museum director gasp for air. Uh, it's just, it's an enormous number. Um, and most museums are working at a much smaller scale. Um, 150 million artifacts and it was my job as director of the Smithsonian Affiliations Program to help get those artifacts 
out of storage and share them with museums across the country. We know that not everyone in America comes to Washington, can go visit the Smithsonian if they're lucky, maybe once in a lifetime, but you know, the vast majority never make it here. And we took on the mission at the Smithsonian to bring, if you can't come here, we will bring the Smithsonian into your community. So that was my job as director of the Smithsonian Affiliations Program. Of course, I had a small staff and we worked very hard to create, uh, at this time, uh, over 200 partnerships with museums all across America. Once those partnerships were in place, it becomes easier to uh, facilitate loans and to develop collaborative projects. So let me just give you a quick example of how that works. So one day I got a phone call from the director of the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in Dubuque, Iowa. The really wonderful place, right on the Mississippi River. Um, and he explained to me that they had an exhibit at that time called Totally Frogs. Uh, these were frogs from around the world. Um, and I thought it was you know, pretty incredible when you start looking at them. Um, what was really interesting in addition to this was that this was a traveling exhibit produced by the Aquarium of the Americas in New Orleans. That uh, aquarium uh, lost all its power during Hurricane Katrina and it lost its, its staff couldn't come in for two weeks and there was no power there. Everything in that aquarium died uh, 2005 Katrina, except for these toads, these toads that were on a travel, they were traveling, they were in Iowa at the time. So the director called me, tells me he's got this exhibit, and but for some reason they're not getting the visitation that they would hope for. And so he said, do you have anything at the Smithsonian that might help, uh, you know, bring a little more visibility to this? So I instantly thought, well, yeah, sure. We have Kermit. This is the original Kermit. Jim Henson gave this, his very first Kermit to us. Now, if you may not know, Jim Henson was born in Greenville, Mississippi, grew up in Leland, Mississippi, which calls itself the birthplace of Kermit the Frog. So there is a definite Mississippi River connection to Kermit and the National Mississippi River Museum. So uh, my colleagues at the Museum of American History where Kermit usually lives, so we're not so happy that I had made this suggestion. I didn't have the power to give anything away, but um, and they were concerned that children would stop coming to the Smithsonian if Kermit wasn't there. But I, I explained, we still have the Ruby Slippers, we have Howdy Doody, we have Charlie McCarthy, R2D2, you know, maybe they'll still come. So they agreed. Kermit went out to the Mississippi River Museum uh, for about six months and, and everyone brought more people in and, uh, and everyone was happy and he came back and he, you can see him at the Museum of American History now. So um, now you don't have to go to, um, you don't have to go to Iowa to see how we have shared our collections uh, with other museums around the country. Right up the road in Baltimore is the National Museum of Dentistry. Who knew? Uh, and we have loaned, the Smithsonian has loaned to them, George Washington's teeth. Um, it's appropriate for a museum of dentistry. Here's another spoiler alert. Th these teeth are not wooden. George Washington did not have wooden teeth. They were made out of hippopotamus ivory. Um, and many art historians have noted that George Washington's face changes over time um, at, at various stages. And it's, it's, a, it's believed that part of the reason the shape of his mouth changes is because he could never get the right dentures. And, and we do have letters from Washington to, his, to the denture maker in New York complaining all the time that they didn't fit right, they hurt, and, and so on. And, and so some people have deduced that you can see the effects of his dentures in his, the port in, the, his, uh, in his face. So now while you're in Baltimore, you can also go to the B&O Railroad Museum and see the, very, the oldest steam locomotive engine in the Western Hemisphere it's called the Stour Bridge Lion. Uh, and it actually operated, it was built in England, but it was operated in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. 
1829 to 1834. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have been to the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia? Okay. So this opened on the National Mall in 2010. Vice President Biden presided over the opening of this. As they were planning this museum, they, they decided that the centerpiece, the keys, the signature exhibit would be called Only in America Hall of Fame. And, and you've, it's, you see it as you come in on the first floor of that museum. Well, they came to us and said, do you, do you have anything that could help us? Um, you know, so not me, but my colleagues looked around and said, well, how about Albert Einstein's pipe? We have it. And uh, it turns out that Einstein actually said that, uh, that when he was alone, he had some of his most important thoughts when he was by himself smoking this pipe. So there's a lot of, his doctor told him to stop smoking it, but but it was critical to his uh, thought process. Um, so we, we loaned them that pipe and I think it's still there. Sandy Koufax's baseball mitt. Sandy Koufax, often called the left hand of God uh, and known famously for refusing to pitch in the World Series on Yom Kippur in 1965. So that's there again, from the Smithsonian, and uh, some original vials of the Salk vaccine, the polio Salk vaccine. If you, if you could look carefully on the labels, you see 1952. And it, this was from the very first set of trials um, that uh, Jonas Salk conducted uh, with that. So um, just a few other quick examples, and I'll come back to Horace. Uh, if you want to see uh, Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem, that one. It's at the Kansas Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas. The cornet that Louis Armstrong learned to play on when he was in an orphanage at the age of 15. First, first cornet that he uh, played on. Uh, and that's at the Musical Instrument Museum in uh, Phoenix or Scottsdale, Arizona. Wonderful place. Uh, who knew? Did you know the Smithsonian has the National Scarab Beetle Collection? All 250,000 of them. Well, they're currently on loan to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska, where they have the world's most famous scarab beetle entomologist. He knows them all by name. Um, I love this one. They call it the mother of Swiss Army knives. Uh, it's actually, it's German. It was made in 1880. The Swiss didn't make a Swiss army knife until 1892. So they were 12 years late, but they got their name on it. This was made in Germany. And if you look real close right here, there's actually a little pistol, um, a 22 caliber pistol that works. Um, and it's from our collection and we've loaned it to the uh, Buffalo Bill Center for the West in Cody, Wyoming. Um, and then last, uh, my favorite, this is an Alamosaurus. You want to guess where it's from or where it is now? In Texas. That's right. One of the largest full-scale dinosaurs found uh, called an Alamosaurus. It's on display at the uh, Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas. Uh, the way it was assembled, it turns out the Smithsonian had some parts of the Alamosaurus. The University of Texas had some parts of the Alamosaurus. And the museum, the Perot Museum itself, had some parts of the Alamosaurus. So they were all brought together to try to figure out how to put it together. And the missing parts were produced on a 3D printer. So uh, it's uh, 100 feet long. 50 tons, um, and uh, it's the centerpiece of, uh, of what they, so that, that's kind of a brief, this is what I was doing for 13 years at the Smithsonian, just trying to give it away, it was fun. Um, one of our partner museums is called Plymouth Plantation, they've actually changed their name now, it's called Plymouth Patuxet Museum, 
It's an outdoor living history museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And it's kind of like the Williamsburg of the uh, early colonial experience there, pilgrims. Uh, there's a large uh, tribal component. Um, and it's a very highly visited, well-known museum, especially uh, in Massachusetts, uh, in that area. Uh, they invited me to, uh, because they were part of the museum, they invited me to a, a luncheon where they were gathering their friends and supporters to, um, you know, bring everyone up to date on what they're doing. And uh, I was seated between Geraldine Brooks and Rose Styron. Um, well, you know, Geraldine Brooks is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, fortunately, I'd read a few of her books. Rose Styron was uh, the wife of William Styron, Sophie's Choice, The Confessions of Matt Turner. She's a writer, poet, activist in her own right. And so I'm, and they both live on uh, Martha's Vineyard. So it's, it's, um, easy for them to be friends of the museum and to come over from time to time for events like this. So I, I found myself sitting between the two of them, the hairs kind of raising up on the back of my neck and I'm trying to make small talk. Oh, I love this book. Oh, I love that book. Oh yeah. I wrote a paper on the confessions of Nat Turner in college and, and, you know, trying to keep the conversation going as best as I could. Well, finally it came to the point where one of them turned to me and said, well, what do you do? <laughs> so um, I began to tell them sort of what I've just told you about what the nature of my work was, trying to get the Smithsonian out of Washington and sharing our collections. Uh, but the thing that was most on my mind, because it, it happened fairly uh, shortly before this, was the story of Lexington. So what's the story? One day, I got a phone call from the director of the International Museum of the Horse in Lexington, Kentucky. I had never heard of the International Museum of the Horse, but after 40 years at the Smithsonian, you get to the point where you believe that whatever anyone can think of, there is a museum out there somewhere. And so, uh, and I've since learned this is like the greatest museum of horses anywhere in the world. But uh, Bill Cook, the director of the International Museum of the Horse said, you have Lexington and we want him back. I said, who's Lexington? I didn't know who Lexington was. Uh, and, you know, and so he proceeded to tell me how in 1878, Lexington was sold to the Smithsonian you know, he's three years dead by, at this time, but the Smithsonian came down, exhumed him, and brought his bones back to Washington, assembled them. We call this articulating a skeleton. This picture shows him on display outside behind the castle, uh, sometime probably in the 1880s uh, or so, at various times. He was out there. Eventually, he was placed in the Bone Hall, or the Hall of Osteology, at the National Museum of Natural History. And I'm pretty sure this is um, And so, I, you know, I said, yeah, I'll, okay, now that I know who Lexington is and where he is, I'll see if I can help out, see if I can. So I went over to the Museum of Natural History to see if I could find Lexington. And that horse that you see there was gone. It was a label in the case that said, um, temporarily off display. So, okay, well, you know, so I called the curator and said, okay, well, I'm looking for Lexington, where is it? Oh, we loaned Lexington over to the Museum of American History. So bones of a horse loaned to American, why would you do that? Well, it turns out that at the Museum of American History, someone, they had just done a new exhibit on clocks and watches. They refurbished the old clocks and watches hall. And it turns out that the stopwatch was invented because of Lexington. 
in the in the mid 19th century, there was not an accurate way of measuring the speed of a horse. People were obsessed with time and speed, as we still are now, but there weren't there was not uh, the ability to really get it. So um, now the stopwatch may have been started slightly before that, but Lexington actually ran against the stopwatch and that became a very famous race in and of itself. And if you can read the small print there, um, this became the first, the Waltham Watch Company in Massachusetts be, started mass producing stopwatches, calling them improved horse timing watches. So that was the first name of a stopwatch. So there, I wish I had a picture, but if you walked into this exhibit at American history, the first thing you'd see would be the skeleton of a horse. Clock on time is the name of the exhibit. There's a skeleton of a horse. And you say, why is that there? But once you go up and read the story of the stopwatch, you get the idea. And it was a very compelling way of getting people into that exhibit. Um, I spoke with the curator of that exhibit and fortunately, that exhibit was scheduled to be closed in about a year from that time. And I was able to get everyone to agree that it would be appropriate to um, return Lexington back to Lexington, Kentucky. One of, the, um, one of the motivating factors was that in 2010, Lexington, Kentucky was hosting the World Equestrian Games. Now that's kind of like the Olympics for the horse set. And, uh, it was the very first time in the United States they were expanding the airport so planes could come directly from Saudi Arabia to Lexington, Kentucky uh, with, uh, you know, with their horses uh, to be part of these games. And it was a huge deal. Well, the, uh, we, we, sent, like, we hired a, a team of very expert um, uh, uh, art handlers who, who packed Lexington. Uh, very carefully, they thought he, he would ship better if the head was placed somewhere else. But but he did, he came back, and this is how he's currently displayed now at the International Museum of the Horse. Well, the city of Lexington was so pleased by this that they decided to make Lexington the symbol of the city of Lexington in honor of uh, the upcoming world equestrian games for some reason they decided to that he should be blue um maybe because uh kentucky's the bluegrass state i'm not quite sure and when lexington came back uh, they had a big parade and banners hanging from from every lamp post and and all over town you know you could see that that lexington was a local hero and um uh, and how happy they were that Lexington had finally come home. Um, the bones, oh, okay, colors of the University of Kentucky. Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, so it, you know, it all worked out well. He, he still belongs to the Smithsonian. We we rarely let anything out of our possession, but there's a, it's a long term agreement, and I'm sure he'll he'll be there forever. Now, I just want to end uh, and come back to Geraldine Brooks, um, because I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that uh, my contribution to her creating this book um, has as much weight as it might be, as it might appear. She did an incredible amount of research on her own. She got in touch with me after this lunch and asked if I would um, to set up some meetings with her, uh, with someone who knew how to articulate a horse and skeleton, uh, someone who knew the real history of equestrian painting. It's a very important genre. And the Smithsonian itself, the first picture I showed you, um, comes from the Smithsonian collection. There are other famous paintings of Lexington and other famous paintings not in the Smithsonian. And she wanted to speak with the curator who knew the story of the stopwatch. So I, I helped her have those meetings. And, um, and then she was off on her own. Uh, she did an incredible amount of research. She, it, again, it's much more than the story of the horse. Uh, I won't give it away or try to say too much about it, but um, 
her research into the history of slavery at that time, and the role of uh, slaves and freed uh, in the racing uh, world, the Civil War, uh, art history, um, Smithsonian conservation practices. It's, it's a wide range of things, all of which credit to her uh, for having uh, researched. She's an incredible researcher. Uh, for researching and pulling together what's a very, very compelling story. In addition to that, her husband uh, died while she was writing this book, uh, Tony Horowitz. Maybe some of you know, is a great writer, Washingtonian. Um, and that, uh, in my mind, is even more inspiring that she persisted and kept up with this to bring this book to conclusion. So, um, Again, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm very, I'm happy to take any questions. Harold, I, I will take the mic to whomever you identify as okay. a question. Well, please. Hold it. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> so you're sitting between these, Harold, so you're sitting between these, between these two women, what's the rest of the conversation you had with these women? <laughs> well, particularly with, with Geraldine Brooks, you stopped. Well, uh, you know, it took me a while to get that whole horse story out there. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to play up our, uh, our, our role with Plymouth itself. Uh, we share some artifacts in common with Plymouth plantation. And, uh, and we've had, uh, several programs with them. We got a very large grant by the Lilly Foundation to look at uh, a religion in America in the 17th century. So, uh, you know, it was, it was mostly small talk, but, um, you know, once I started, got into Lexington, as my wife knows, I, it's hard to stop me. And, uh, and Geraldine, uh, I didn't know that, uh, that she's a horse lover. I mean, she, she owns horses on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, I didn't know that either. And I didn't know that, that she was that interested in what I was saying until she called me back. We also have an audience on Zoom. Uh, anything from there, Jerry? I'm fascinated by the 150 million um, artifacts that you have stored. How do you even begin to access? And when somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're doing X, Y, Z, and we need, you know, what, what do you have to offer us? Yeah. Uh, well, usually they, sometimes they know um, because the, uh, they know their own local history and they know, especially if there are things at the Smithsonian that came from their community, they know, like uh, just for example, um, Peoria, Illinois, is the home of the Caterpillar um, tractor company. Uh, and the Smithsonian has the very first Caterpillar diesel engine. And they know that because uh, every time an employee from Peoria came to Washington, they found that track, they found that engine and took their picture. So there was a brand new museum being built with fun help from Caterpillar in Peoria. Um, called the Peoria Riverfront Museum, great museum. And they said, well, we know you have this. Uh, if it's not that kind of story, then we just, it's a series of conversations and phone calls. We, we look at what it is they do, what it is that we do, um, and uh, what makes the most sense and try to help out. Uh, I'll say two more things on that. One. Of that 150 million, about half of them are insects. Okay, <laughs> they're free, freeze-dried insects. So, except for the scarab beetles, I've never dealt with any other any other parts of the insect collection. So that's one. That's what inflates that number a lot. The other, the more interesting thing, is because I showed you Apollo 13, by law, the Smithsonian owns anything that NASA decommissions. Once it's not, that was part of the legislation that established the National Air and Space Museum. 
once NASA doesn't need it anymore or can't use it anymore, it belongs to the Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian has every space capsule that flew, and every space suit, um, and, and so much more. So we can only display so many space capsules uh, on the mall or out at the, uh, the new facility near Dulles. And there's a, a lot of space history all over the country, whether the home of an astronaut like Jim Lovell in Chicago, or the fact that Oklahoma has produced more astronauts than any other state. So we've loaned a space capsule to the Oklahoma History Center, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Dallas. Um, we've got space capsules all over the country <laughs> and that helped. Um, so it's, it's just a lot of conversation talking to the right people. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Every, everything is, is of course cataloged, but um, it's easier just to, to talk with people and try to narrow it down. Yes, uh, wait a minute. Oh, I think back- We have right, a lady in the back here. Yeah, that's you. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about the job of uh, data entry operations beginning in the 70s, maybe. And um, I have two questions. One, is that complete? <laughs> and uh, the second question, uh, in my next life, I've decided I want your job. <laughs> so uh, what kind of formal and informal education did you have to get this glorious profession? Well, I, I, uh, I'll answer that part first. I, I, the, the thing about uh, data systems is harder for me. Um, I, uh, I was a history major at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and I studied folklore uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania graduate school. And so uh, my first job at the Smithsonian and my, my first love uh, was in folk music, and uh, and because I'm, I'm a native Washingtonian and and even in high school, I used to sneak off to go to the Smithsonian Folklife Festival. That that was like my dream. And when I found out you could actually get a job there, you know, in the summer of 1976 was a the bicentennial summer, the Smithsonian Folklife Festivals, 12 weeks long. It went. It was all along the reflecting pool from the Lincoln Memorial to 17th Street, and and so you know there there were just uh, it was the right time, the right place. I was able to get a summer job there, and and uh, one thing led to another, and I, I was able to stay on and grow up in the Smithsonian. Regarding, uh, I you know I I I, I can't I don't really know the the data system part side. So I can say this, I do remember a time when each museum had its own system. And, and it's in the museum world itself, it's very hard and complicated. And there is still not agreement as to what are the fields that you need to enter to catalog an object, a history museum, an art museum, a science museum. They're all very different. And, and the demands of each of those are, you know, or a scarab beetle is different than the Hope Diamond, or you know, and so the, there's always debate and argument within the museum field as a whole. Um, and in the beginning, the fact that there were so many different systems that didn't talk to each other. Now, eventually, they they got to a point where the you know the Smithsonian is on one central uh, system, and and things talk to each other. But there's still there's a lot of uh, information that's still in the heads of curators. There's a lot of information that's still on three by five cards because it's very labor intensive. Even if you had complete agreement on the, the data fields, and even if you had the perfect system in which to enter it, it's a, it's a lot of human labor to take that information from wherever it has been stored and move it over. So that's the best answer I can give you. Harold, uh, Sherry has somebody in the Zoom, Zoom audience. Okay, Zoom. Hi, um, this is from Marsha. Okay, Marsha uh, Semmel. Um, no, not Marsha Zemmel. Uh, but uh, maybe Semmel. 
Yeah. I don't know. She didn't give me the last name. But she, uh, given the contributions you said from NASA, she wants to know, do you have any of the debris from the space capsules and space stations? I don't know that. Uh, it's entirely possible, but uh, I don't know the answer to that. Yes. One moment. Hold it, please. We can't hear you well. Thank you. Is the facility that you were referring to ever open to the public? I think it is, but I, I haven't looked into it recently to see how you would uh, access it. it. It may be that the Smithsonian Associates has tours that you can go through them. Yeah, or but I think if you just uh, Google the uh, Smithsonian Museum Support Center, you'll see. I know people that are especially in the uh, airplane uh, uh, enthusiasts have find ways to uh, to go in and see it. Yes. I wondered if there are any other famous bones, either human or animal, that are in your attic, which is in an attic. <laughs> well, we do have the uh, General Sheridan's horse, uh, taxidermied, not bones, but uh, he was a Civil War uh, general. Someone actually wrote a dissertation on, on uh, all the Civil War horses that are in museums and on display. That was... That was a big thing after the Civil War on, on both sides to uh, preserve the horses and uh, and keep them there. Uh, I you know there's a controversy going on right now over uh, the repatriation of Native American remains. So the Smithsonian uh, and you've probably read about this in the paper. Uh, uh, the Secretary of the Smithsonian issued a, a very eloquent apology, and uh, the Smithsonian as are most museums now in America, uh, are, are working uh, very hard to uh, identify uh, the tribes that Native American remains belong to and to repatriate them. Um, so, you know, there, there's that. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, in the, the, all the bones and the dinosaurs and everything else are, are, are very noteworthy. Uh, Mara, uh. <clears throat> Harold, you said that uh, the museum people don't like that nation's attic. Yes. But I remember an exhibit called the nation's <laughs> attic. And in that exhibit, I was really, there were some really weird things, including a bunch of scarab beetles, but I think they were missing their, they were used at like sequins on. Yes. So I was wondering if those are considered insects or, you know, went with, went <laughs> with the scarab uh, beetle collection. They may be of... in part of a jewelry collection somewhere. <laughs> yeah. No, if you, in Mexico, they sell scar live scarab beetles, oh. bejeweled live scarab beetles that you can pin to your lapel and they kind of crawl around. Uh, I remember that exhibit too. It was kind of an inside joke. Uh, uh, nation's attic. They covered the entrance with cobwebs and, and all of those things. But, you know, it was an attempt to play off the fact that that's what everyone thinks, you know, we have. Harold, I think most of the people in this room um, are at the stage of life where they have too much stuff. Yes. <laughs> so we wonder whether the Smithsonian has ever retained uh, decluttering consultants. <laughs> Uh, not that I know. I, I, I worked very closely with the musical instrument division for a long time, and they would get uh, practically a, 10 letters a week from people who found an old violin in their attic and, and were convinced that it was a Strad. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, that it's not, you know, there are local historical societies. Uh, um, and they do have workshops and seminars, the DC Historical Society, or also the DC History Center, which is located on uh, um, Mount Vernon uh, Triangle, Mount Vernon Square, sorry. <laughs> uh, they do have workshops, and uh, I'm sure if you live in Montgomery County or Fairfax or, or anywhere else, there, there are a lot of local historical societies that, that will do that for you. And there's a lot of information online. 
too. Going back to the commentary about um, the uh, saving and donation of human of human remains that has re received a great deal of publicity in the media. Uh, what was the the reason for uh, yeah for yeah. maintaining these well, items? It, there, it's a good question, and and I, I would say there are two reasons: one one good and one not good. Uh, the scientific reason uh, for uh, keeping and studying human remains is that they tell a lot. There's a lot of information about diet, uh, disease, uh, human migration, um, climate change. Uh, it's, it's from just a pure scientific point of view. There's a lot of information that is stored in, in a bone uh, or in the DNA that can be extracted. So, uh, and, and that has led, uh, again, this is not my field, but I, I, I take it for granted from my science colleagues that, you know, that, that has been a very important part of, of why these collections are in museums. The not so good reason is that in the early days of anthropology, in the 19 in the early 19 and late 1800s early 1900s um, the field of anthropology was was built on the notion that there was a hierarchy of of human evolution that some people were at the top and and some people were at the bottom and that some people were inferior and other people uh, were superior and that the collection of these bones, measurements of heads, and and all this—it's a you know—it's recognized now as a pseudoscience, but it was it was very strong and 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 forceful in those days, and so um, the easiest place to collect these bones was from jail, paupers' prisons, hospitals, um, and graves. Uh, and that's where most museums uh, got these things from. Medical schools, uh, you know, needed these kinds of specimens as well to teach medicine. So, um, so I mean, that that's the story behind it. But what you're hearing now a lot is that piece of history of the field of anthropology itself, uh, and the sort of the shameful uh, principles that. Um, were driving it in its earliest days. I hope that's a good explanation. Yeah. So Harold, since Geraldine had such a success with this one yeah. story, has she called you again and say, what else you got for me? <laughs> no, no I, I have seen her on other occasions and uh, I, I, I don't know what she's working on. And, um, I'm leaving her alone, and I think she's leaving me alone, which is fine. <laughs> the strange thing about this book, I, I've heard from people that I haven't heard from in years, even even relatives that I didn't even know I had. You know, how oh, I saw your name in the book, and you know, how am I related to you? <laughs> but but it, it has been a it's been a wonderful ride. It's something I just never never ever expected. Well, I think it's tempting for those of us who live here to kind of take the Smithsonian for granted and that it's going to be free. Could you just, I know this isn't your specialty, but just go tell us what the budget of the complex is and who funds it. Uh, the, I, it it's impossible for me to tell you what the budget is because it's, it's a combination of congressional funding uh, private philanthropy and uh, a lot of grants, uh, both government contracts and uh, and foundation grants. Each museum, of course, uh, has its own needs and its own budget. Uh, in addition to the museums, there are many uh, central offices or non-museum facilities. Most people don't know, for instance, that uh, probably the largest budget center of the Smithsonian 
is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at what's called the Harvard, the Smithsonian Harvard Center for Astrophysics. Uh, it's over 100 years old. The Smithsonian has been in partnership with Harvard um, in the field of astrophysics. So we operate, we own telescopes in Arizona, in Hawaii. We're in the process of building the world's largest multiple mirror telescope in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. Um, and uh, these are things not just the Smithsonian, they're done through a consortium. Uh, we have 500 employees in Panama at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Uh, when the canal opened in the early 1900s, um, it, it, Panama Canal doesn't look like a real canal the way you think it is. It's a series of flooded lakes. Uh, and it's only at the two ends that it, it looks like the conventional image of a canal. Those, when they flooded all these lakes, what had been mountains became isolated, the tops of the mountains became isolated islands in the middle of the Panama Canal. And the Smithsonian said, well, what's gonna happen with all the animals? Now that we have all these animals trapped on these islands in the canal, we can study them and see what happens over a long period of time. So that is the longest continuous study of tropical diversity uh, anywhere in the world over 120 years now. So a, it's, a, you know, roughly speaking, the Smithsonian gets about two thirds of its funding from uh, Congress um, and the other third from contracts, grants and, and um, philanthropy. But it's, that number would be, it's too hard to figure it out off the top of my head. And it's, it's not a simple line item. Um, so, but if you're, you know, your contributions are always welcome. <laughs> Since you rely on the government uh, Congress for much of your support, is that any at all go into the thinking of where the next regional Smithsonian uh, operation may go and whose congressional district? Well, um, you know, we were always trying to be very equitable and, and build as many partnerships around the country as we could. Um, you know, the Smithsonian is in the process of building two new museums now. Uh, it has been, you know, chartered by Congress. That's the only way a new museum gets started at the Smithsonian. One is the National Museum of Women in American History. And the, the, today's paper, they just announced uh, the appointment of a director. Uh, the other is the National Museum of the American Latino. Now, both of those museums are in a planning phase right now. Um, the, the, they both have boards, they both have directors, they both have a uh, small staff. The, the first critical um, issue will be to select a site in Washington and to get Congress to approve that. So that's, if you wanna keep your eyes on things, that's, that's what to look for. It typically, when they did the Museum of uh, African-American History and Culture, it took about 15 years from the point of uh, congressional authorization to final opening. So um, it'll probably take that for these two museums. Uh, part of the reason they created the Smithsonian Affiliations Program was to avoid uh, pressure from communities to create a new Smithsonian in their communities. Uh, when I first came in, uh, there were a lot of military base closings. So think of the Presidio in San Francisco, a prime piece of property right next to Golden Gate Bridge, um, military uh, base that was decommissioned. Um, they were hoping that the Smithsonian would come out and build a museum there, uh, an Air Force base in Colorado, uh, there, a mayor in Long Beach, California, where, wherever uh, you know, anyone had the bright idea for uh, uh, something to uh, regenerate the local community, um, they thought the Smithsonian would be a good place to start. And so the program, the, the Smithsonian Affiliations Program was created in part to say, no, you know, we really can't 
go around the country building museums, but we can partner with you and we can share our collections with you. And I, I think that's been very successful. So that's where we are now. Well, thank you so much. It's been a, been a real pleasure. <laughs>